U.S. foreign policy must contend with growing threats at a time when the American public is exhausted by adventures abroad and divided over what American leadership in the 20th first century should be. To walk us through our complex and dangerous world is National Security Advisor Susan Rice, who has been part of the Obama administration in some capacity since the President's first term. She's joined here in conversation with Wall Street Journal, Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief Jerry Seib. Susan Rice, Jerry Seib. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you for coming. Um, I was struck thinking about preparing these questions for you, um, that there's hardly anything going on in the world. Um, you must have a spare time on your hands constantly, so um, we'll try to steer past that to a couple of things that are happening right now. Let me start with, with Syria and with the Islamic State. Um, and I'm going to ask you a question you may not have been, ever been asked about this subject before, which is, what happens if we win? What happens if we defeat Islamic State? And I ask you this because you've put together a nice coalition to combat Islamic State, but the only thing they probably agree on is that Islamic State or ISIL ought to be defeated, because when it comes to what should happen in Syria, what should happen to President Assad, what should happen in Iraq, what should happen to the Kurds, they don't agree on much of anything. How do you hold this coalition together? If you're successful, what happens then? Well, Jerry, first of all, thank you for, uh, for doing this, and I look forward to the conversation, and thank you all for being here. If and when, because I do believe we will uh, degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL with our coalition of over 60 countries, um, we, let's think about what that end state looks like. First of all, it means that ISIL, uh, which currently poses a serious threat to not only Iraq and Syria and the neighboring countries, but potentially uh, to the United States and, and Europe, will no longer have a functional safe haven in that critical region. It will no longer be in a position to terrorize and, and destabilize both those countries, but uh, the, the neighboring countries as well. Denying ISIL a safe haven is a critical strategic objective, um, because as we've seen from such safe havens to which foreign fighters and others are attracted, they can export uh, terrorism and other forms of violence. So that in itself is a critical objective. That will not, in and of itself, resolve the problem of Syria. Um, it will substantially create breathing space for the new Iraqi government and uh, the, um, the leadership there uh, to stabilize and, and unify that country, which is facing its own uh, sectarian and, and economic and other challenges. So it takes uh, a critical uh, um, impediment off the table for Iraq, but it, it does, as you acknowledge, leave a challenge in Syria. Remember, the, uh, the conflict in Syria began uh, over three years ago mm. when peaceful protesters challenged the Assad regime, and the Assad regime responded with overwhelming uh, and indiscriminate violence, which it has sustained. The political issues uh, that remain at the heart of the Syrian conflict will endure. The, the, the majority Sunni population has largely been excluded from uh, power. There is no democratic process. You have an illeg illegitimate and and exceedingly violent leadership uh, that has created conditions not only that have been so harmful to the population, but have uh, in, it made it a, a very attractive uh, magnet for terrorists. The magnet having been eliminated, uh, we will still need to see a political solution in Syria, and that's been our view all along, that there's ultimately not a military solution to the conflict. Does that solution still require that President Assad go? It, it will ultimately have to uh, result in Assad's departure because it, given the violence that he's perpetrated and given the divisions that, that are now, I, I believe, uh, unbridgeable ultimately, you may have a transition period of some sort, but Assad's departure is going to be critical for there to be lasting stability in Syria. And that's one of the main reasons, uh, Jerry, that we have supported the moderate Syrian opposition and why we are trying to substantially ramp up that support not only to counter ISIL, but also to create an environment, ultimately, in which it's more likely that there is an, a negotiated settlement. But as you know, there's been some confusion in the last uh, 48 hours about whether we're arming the Free Syrian Army, the moderate opposition, to fight the Islamic State or to fight President Assad. Are they doing both? Or are they, they supposed they're to do having to do both as we speak. Uh, they are fighting a multi-front conflict, uh, which is obviously taking a real toll on them. So our support 
for the moderate opposition is, in the first instance, uh, going to enable them uh, to fend off ISIL, but it is also designed and originated with the concept of, of trying to help create uh, conditions on the ground that are conducive to negotiations, and that means uh, helping them in their conflict against Assad as well. Let, let step, let's step back from this a little bit and look at the, at the region. Um, Syria's borders arguably don't really exist anymore. Iraq is, is a, a, somewhere between one and three states, some people think. Uh, Jordan is imperiled by Islamic State. Uh, Lebanon is, is, could conceivably be threatened. What does this region look like in 10 years? Which states survive? How does it get put, put back together again? I think the nation states survive. Uh, I think, again, in the context of uh, a successful outcome vis-a-vis -vis ISIL, the, the border between Iraq and Syria, which is really the one that has uh, uh, become more blurred, um, will be fully reestablished. Um, obviously, you know, Israel's borders uh, will be uh, very fully and, and well defended, remain sacrosanct, and our commitment to that is unshakable. But what's happening, Le Lebanon has long had uh, its, its share of, of internal challenges. I don't suspect that they will go away uh, as a result of, of ISIL. Uh, being defeated. But um, Jordan is one of the countries that has been um, most uh, challenged by the, over, the outflow, the overflow right. of, of refugees and the, the spillover of the conflict. Maybe even transformed ultimately by that. And we have invested very heavily uh, in supporting the Jordanian uh, government, um, helping to build its capacity, helping it deal with the refugee outflow. Um, and so I think Jordan um, will be a place where our support and that of others uh, in the region and beyond will be critical to, to shore up a country that, is, uh, that has suffered the brunt of, of much of what's transpired in Syria. Let me move a little further west in the region and ask you about Israel. Uh, our mutual friend Jeffrey Goldberg wrote a piece this week saying that U.S.-Israeli relations are in a state of crisis. Uh, I guess the twofold question is, are they? And are they strong enough, even if they're not in crisis, to withstand some tough decisions that lie ahead about the Iranian nuclear program? The relationship is not in crisis. Uh, the relationship is actually fundamentally stronger in many respects than it's ever been. Uh, we have the greatest and strongest security cooperation between the United States and Israel that has ever uh, occurred, and Prime Minister Netanyahu has heralded that on many occasions. President Obama and, and Prime Minister Netanyahu um, have a constructive and effective relationship. They have met one another more frequently than President Obama has met any other uh, foreign leader. He was just in the Oval Office earlier this month for uh, extensive consultations. Tonight, I am taking my Israeli counterpart, uh, the National Security Advisor, to dinner on the eve of what we do two times a year, which is uh, I will host tomorrow uh, a large Israeli delegation for something called the Israeli uh, consultative group where they bring equivalents from their intelligence community, their defense uh, establishment, their uh, diplomatic establishment. They meet with our colleagues and counterparts at very senior levels in all of those agencies. And we share information and, and engage uh, in strategy on the range of issues that are of mutual interest in the region, uh, from Iran to uh, to the, the ISIL and, and all of the issues that, that we're discussing here today and, and many others. That kind of deep cooperation, consultation, sharing, strategizing is unprecedented and that's something that has evolved uh, uniquely in this administration. So there are issues we disagree on. The, the most uh, prominent one that you have uh, seen manifested itself unfortunately in the press has been on the issue of settlements. Right where for decades the United States has had a different view of settlements and their legitimacy than the Israeli government has. The U.S. view has long been under multiple administrations that settlement activity is illegitimate and it's counterproductive to the goal of a two-state solution. Obviously, this Israeli government has taken a different view and when such announcements are made that, uh, uh, that are sub significant in their consequence, um, we're compelled to comment on them, but that's not a reflection um, of the health of the larger bilateral relationship, which uh, is quite strong. Um, interestingly, at the same time, there seem to be a lot more areas of common ground between the U.S. and Iran emerging, um, not the least of which is ISIL, obviously, but you know, perhaps even a stable Iraq, perhaps uh, some other areas where there have been disagreements in the past. Is this, a, is this our kind of a detente emerging with the Iranians? And 
does that lead to a successful outcome of the conversations with them, of the negotiations over the uh, nuclear program? I saw such a story on the front page Perhaps of you your did. esteemed newspaper <laughs> this morning. Small. That is not a term I would I didn't ask you to use, use it. Use or <laughs> even consider using. Detente, no. Okay, not use, your, at all. use your term. No, frankly, we still have a, a very difficult uh, and, and, and fraught relationship with Iran for all the obvious reasons. They uh, have a record of supporting terrorism. They have a record of destabilizing the neighboring states and countries in the region. Uh, and we're very, very concerned also about their uh, effort to obtain a nuclear weapon. What is true is that over the course of the last year, uh, we have been able to reach uh, and implement a interim agreement that has halted all progress in the Iranian nuclear program and rolled it back in some critical respects. Uh, this joint agreement uh, has created a, a more stable foundation for negotiations aimed at trying to reach a comprehensive agreement to uh, eliminate any risk that Iran can develop a nuclear weapon. Uh, those negotiations, as you know, and maybe others do too, um, are uh, coming to an important milestone uh, in November, when by the 24th of November, uh, we have uh, the period of negotiations expiring. So um, there is no detente, there is frankly no uh, dramatic change in the nature of the relationship. If we were to achieve uh, an agreement on the nuclear program, that would be a very significant accomplishment, which would make Americans more secure and the region more secure. But uh, it wouldn't end our concerns about other aspects of their of behavior. Odds of success on that? It's hard to judge. Um, I would say, you know, 50% or less. Um, shifting to Russia and Ukraine, because um, I wanted to touch on that and Ebola before our time runs out. President uh, Putin gave a remarkable address late last week, which makes for fascinating reading at an international conference, which he said um, that the U.S. declared itself the winner of the Cold War, tried to impose a univ universal diktat on the globe. It has supported since then neo-fascists and Islamic radicals, uh, has uh, used economic and propaganda pressure to meddle in other nations' domestic affairs, has resorted to outright blackmail against a number of world leaders, has supported a coup d'etat in Ukraine, and is spending billions of dollars to keep the whole world under surveillance. Um, how's that relationship going? <laughs> yeah, and more seriously, can you work with him? It sounds like a, a classic Soviet diatribe. <laughs> um, the relationship with Russia is obviously very strained by uh, its um, actions to illegally annex uh, Crimea uh, and its uh, infiltration into uh, the rest of Ukraine. Um, the relationship is also in, under great strain because the United States has successfully rallied uh, the, the major economies to impose now very biting sanctions on the Russian economy uh, to uh, extract a, a very high price for their behavior. Now, they have withdrawn the bulk, but not all of their uh, forces from Ukraine, and there is a very fragile um, Minsk agreement and sometimes ceasefire, uh, which is thankfully uh, created space so that the Ukrainians could have a successful election mm -hmm. uh, for their parliament last uh, Sunday, uh, and we hope will uh, enable President Poroshenko to have the kind of governing coalition that will enable him to enact critical reforms and, and move as he has chosen to towards Europe. But the relationship with Russia is strained, uh, and there remain areas where we have been able to continue working together in a constructive vein. The Iran negotiations are one example of that. Um, and, and I could give you others, but there are a, a wider uh, range of areas where uh, the, the relationship is more difficult. I did want to ask about Ebola before we run out of time. You're heading off for some uh, conversations with the president and others about that this afternoon, as I understand it. Um, what have you learned about um, the world's ability to cope with a problem like this since the outbreak of the Ebola uh, crisis, if that's not too strong a word. Well, Jerry, I think, first of all, it's important to understand that what it, we have all learned as a consequence of Ebola is something that, that we understood quite a while ago, which is that the global health infrastructure is exceedingly fragile. Mm -hmm. We saw that following SARS. We've seen that with H1N1 with MERS, which is the, uh, the strange virus that has evolved out of the Gulf region, uh, and recognizing that as a result, um, 
Back in February of this year, President Obama launched something called the Global Health Security Agenda, bringing 40 countries uh, together from around the world to commit to help the more fragile developing countries build their national health infrastructures. And what we've learned in part from the Ebola experience, which frankly Ebola is a far less transmissible mm -hmm. disease than the ones that uh, I just described, can't be transmitted in an airborne fashion. You have to be symptomatic and exchange bodily fluids. And yet it's obviously caused a great deal uh, of, uh, of loss of life in West Africa uh, and fear uh, and effects uh, in, in this country and beyond. We have a national security imperative to build the capacity of countries around the world, whether in West Africa or Southeast Asia uh, or, or parts of, uh, of Central Asia for that matter, mm -hmm. such that they have the healthcare infrastructure to detect and monitor and contain disease. Because we are only as secure, all of, when I say we, I mean the United States, countries of the world, as the weakest link in, uh, in the, the fabric here, in the chain. So, we, and this is, the, this is the illustration that we've seen with Ebola. Um, we are living in an interconnected uh, global economy, global system. We have no direct flights to the United States uh, at the present from, West, uh, from those three countries in West Africa. And yet, uh, our, yeah. uh, we are linked up with them. Uh, some 60 to 70% of the people who travel to the United States from those three countries are in fact American citizens mm -hmm. or green card holders. Right. So we are linked up in a very significant way. And that's true of our relationships with countries around the world. It's not frankly unique to those three countries yeah. in West Africa. So given that, uh, it is critical that over the long term we take from this experience, which we will, we will manage to uh, bring under control with the help of the rest of the international community, the lesson that we have to build for the future. The president had that vision well in advance of the Ebola crisis. We have started this global health security agenda. It is gaining traction and the support of critical partners around the world, but we've got to stay committed to this over the long term. But is that happening? Is there, yes. is there emerging from this some idea of an infrastructure that can prevent yes. round two? And what's, what is it, but it's going to take time because obviously building health infrastructure is not something that happens overnight. But we had at the end of September here in Washington, uh, a major gathering at the mm -hmm. ministerial level of the representatives of these 40 yeah. countries and each of them made commitments to uh, strengthen the healthcare infrastructure and a number of other uh, developing nations, and the United States has taken on its share, other countries are doing their part, uh, and that's going to have to be a set of investments that we sustain over time and take very seriously. L let me ask you this final question. You know, there, there's the, the list of problem areas is long, I even got, didn't even get through them all here. Um, but I want, and, and by the way, the Attorney General got to ask as a, answer as a final question, who, who, who should play him in the movie? You should feel free to answer that question if you would like. Halle Berry. Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Consensus choice, clearly. <laughs> I should be so lucky. <laughs> um, the more serious final question I was going to ask you was this. You know, I wonder, uh, for somebody in your position, when you go home at night, What's the thing you would like to be able to spend your time on that you can't? In other My words, kids. <laughs> okay, that's true. I'm sure that's true. What's the world problem you'd like to be able to devote some brain, brain cells to? Well, Because uh, things get pushed off the radar screen by the crisis of the moment, and most people have in the back of their minds something they wish they could get around to, and I just wonder if there's one of those for you. Well, in fact, Jerry, I mean, it may be hard to imagine if you're watching the television and... Uh, and, and seeing uh, what, is, uh, what is being relayed uh, every day. But the fact of the matter is we have no choice yeah. but to be working not only on the, the, the hot issues or even the crises of the day, but the long-term aspects of our agenda. And what we were just discussing, the global health security mm -hmm. agenda is a classic uh, example of something that gets very little attention or press. Most people wouldn't know about it if it weren't for uh, the Ebola crisis, and even though there is a Ebola crisis, most people don't yep. know about it. Um, but it is building architecture for the long term. And we are doing that in, in many different respects, um, whether it's our nonproliferation agenda and the nuclear security summits that we've held to lock down uh, and try to make much safer 
nuclear materials that are in uh, various disparate places around the world, whether it's our efforts to strengthen the capacity of fragile states more broadly, build open government partnerships, another important initiative of the administration where we're trying to fight corruption and build transparency in, in countries around the world. And I'll give you an interesting example of why that matters. Um, this open government partnership, which now uh, has brought together 60 countries to make commitments that they will share information with their populations. Mm -hmm. You can see you know, where tax revenue goes and, and have all kinds of, of uh, systems that, that hold governments accountable. It's very valuable in general uh, for a democracy, for uh, voters to be able to uh, to know what's going on, but we have one of our open government partners is actually Sierra Leone. Hmm. And because Sierra Leone is part of the system, they have been able to utilize and disseminate information with their population that has been beneficial uh, in communicating and dealing with the Ebola epidemic. So all of these things are interrelated. And even though they may not be front page of the Wall Street Journal, uh, they are important, uh, lasting yeah. contributions that the president is, is committed to locking down that will, in fact, uh, leave behind a, a far more uh, secure and, and far more open and, and, and democratic set of partners around the world. Um, well, Susan Rice, I do hope in the midst of all that you do get more time with your kids. And thank you for taking time today. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it very much.